What a gift God has given us and the gift of surrender. That day in my office, <clears throat> I was talking to Pastor Cooley about, I, I preached on this a while back, the death, the birth, the death, and the rebirth. And God led my mother to start coming to this church, and all we heard was a King James Bible. Nobody preached out of anything else. And when I was a teenager here, I was pretty adamant about the issue. And God then let that die in me, deliberately. Like Jesus deliberately waiting for Lazarus to die. He did it on purpose. Did it for a reason. And so... Going to two different Bible colleges, coming back, pastoring a little church, buying NIV Bibles for people. Um, I just believed what I had been told, that none of the Bibles were right. You had to give them Greek and Hebrew in order for, the, for it to be right. And uh, even at that, I was doing a lousy job with it. And God came into me one day and just very plainly, very um, comfortingly was the Holy Ghost saying, Mike, you know that that Bible's right. Everything in it is true. And immediately I surrendered. It's like the day that you surrendered to salvation I just immediately, I didn't argue with God. I didn't wrestle with Him, didn't fight over it. I just believed it. And belief then, faith is the substance of things hoped for and, and the evidence of things not seen. What that, what that doesn't mean is that you'll never, not, you'll never see it. It means you start with faith, trusting what God said. And then as God opens up His Word to you, you just, it just adds the evidence to what you already believe. God doesn't have to win an argument with us. He just had, when God, did God argue with darkness over creating light? He just said, let there be light. And there was light. And there was no fight, there was no wrestling, there was no war in heaven over it. It's what God said, and it happened. And the universe surrendered to the light, okay? And I surrendered that day to the Bible. But then, as I study it, as I know it, as I meditate on it, as I think on these things, the evidence is all there. The substance is there. And so I still have the faith, but I have the evidence and the substance to go along with it. I know, I know it's right. And so anyway, it's good to know that, amen. Good to know that God's word is right all the time. Let's go to Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 6. And uh, let me see if I can pull up in my notes here where we want to be, where we want to go to. Let me, get that. let me do that again. There we go. Back up a little bit here. Um, we're talking about devils, what they are, where they came from, what they can do, what they're not allowed to do. Do they work for God? Do devils work for the kingdom of God? And I believe they do. God uses them. He used that one spirit who volunteered to God to go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all the prophets unto Ahab. And God said, you just got yourself a job. And he went and did it, and it worked. And so with that story, we get a behind-the-scenes look. We get, 
We put our spiritual glasses on because we can't see the spiritual realm but through the Bible. But once you read it in the Bible, God makes it clear to you why, why so many churches teach false doctrine. Like, I mean, I'm bringing this up again. The evangelical Lutheran pastor at lesbianette with her tattooed arms saying that God said it's okay to look at ethical pornography. Telling everybody it's okay to do that. Now listen, I got I got a hundred dollars that says she does. Okay? Any takers? No, because you know I'm right on that. Okay? That would be the easy bet. Uh, and I'm, going to I'm just going to tell you, and this is what I brought up the other day. Their eyes are full of adultery and they cannot cease from sin. And you don't need to go undercover to spy on false prophets to know what they do. The Bible tells you what they do. The Bible reveals it to you, what's going on behind the scenes. And so anyway, the devils clearly are response. She's got a mouth that every time she speaks, a devil is in her mouth being a lying spirit. Turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. So I want to back up just for a little bit tonight. And let's touch on this, this issue of the strong man. And then we're going to see wrestling with principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. We're going to see why this strong man has to be bound in order for their side to work. So let's go to Mark uh, chapter 3. Yeah, Mark chapter 3, Luke chapter 11. I have them up on the screen, but... Caleb, did that work? No. Hang on, uno momento, por favor. Let's see. I'm connected, right? Let me do this here. See, I bet Caleb has snuck in here and done that. What do you think? Think I'm right on that? See, Cooley, you got to get you an Android tablet instead of the iPad. You just get... See what you, you get the better picture of it, okay? Oh, hush. Now you're making fun of me. Why isn't it working now? I bet Caleb's done that. I bet he has. Start now. Ain't that something? Fine. You're not getting the PowerPoint. Well, you know what? I got to show you some things, though. I got to I got to get this to work. Hang on one second here. Let me change that. Talk amongst yourselves. There it goes. Yeah. Did I ask you for advice? <laughs> oh boy. Technology. Look what it does to us. Go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 3, Luke chapter 11, and then we'll get this going while I'm, while I'm talking, all right? Mark chapter 3, verse 27 and let's go ahead and go to the Lord and pray and ask God to bless and make the devil go sit outside in the cold. Amen. Devil, you might as well get all the cold that you can take in. Because you're going to need it where you're going. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for a, a good day. Thank you, God, for this first day of the week. It belongs to you. It's your day. And, uh, Lord, you said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. So, Father, it's a joy 
to take this first day and make it yours. So, Father, I pray, God, that you'd bless those that have gathered with us tonight, those that are here, those that are visiting with us online, those, Lord, that would be watching this later on. Lord, let it be a blessing and encouragement to them. And, uh, Lord, just open our eyes to show us how our enemy works, how he subverts, how he twists and rests the Scriptures makes it say things that it doesn't say. And Father, I just pray, God, that you would just open our eyes and bless our hearts tonight, teach us some great and mighty things. Thank you, God, for loving us enough, for saving us, and making us your people, Lord. We promise, Lord, to endeavor to serve you as best as we can all the days of our life. Just bless and honor your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 3. I used to I, I used to believe something different about this passage, and I've talked on this before, but I want to kind of squeeze it in tonight. I used to believe that the strong man here was a devil, a devil that had to be bound, a devil that had to be uh, put in chains and bondage and so on. But I don't I don't think that anymore that, because the question is. How does a man become possessed of devils? How does that happen? That a man or a woman or even a child can be possessed and have their, their mind and their thoughts yielding to an evil spirit where that evil spirit makes them do and say things. And I think the key to that is this story that Jesus teaches. Verse 27, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man. And I think the strong man is your consciousness, your rational reasoning, your ability to make decisions for you, uh, free will. God gives mankind free will, free to choose. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. God put two trees in the midst of the garden and said, don't touch this one, eat that one. Now you make the choice. And so to me, God gives man something. He does not give the animal kingdom something. He does not give the angelic realm. He gives man the ability to choose what direction he's going to go, choose his fate, choose where he's going to spend eternity. And so, I think the strong man here is man's reasoning ability to choose. When a person becomes possessed of a devil, that strong man, that choice, has to be bound. And he has to put that in chains so that that man is no longer in charge of his own, of his own body, of his own reasoning, of his own uh, abilities. We know that the, um, the legion there that Jesus delivered this man from, this man had the ability, though they would bind him in chains, he had the ability to break fetters of iron. That's not humanly possible. Your bones will snap before an iron chain will snap. So how this man had the ability to break fetters of iron there must have been and obviously was a supernatural force that strengthened him in such a way. To me, it's almost like someone who's on PCP, angel dust. I mean, those guys, it takes a whole SWAT team to get one guy down on the ground. And usually they're drawing straws over it because nine times out of ten, the guy on PCP is going to be stark naked. Because it makes their body real hot and they shed off all their clothes. And the guys on the SWAT team are going, uh, it's your day. Uh, no, 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 you, I did it last time. You, you gotta go tackle the guy. So that's a big drawn out deal. But anyway, no man can enter the, a strong man's house. You are the house. You are the house. And spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man. Then he will spoil his house. 
Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto you, this, uh, this, unto the sins, sons of men. And blasphemies, whether, so, whether, wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And Luke 11 is a parallel to Mark chapter 3. When a strong man armed, what is it that Paul's telling us, put on the whole armor of God? When a strong man is armed, he's going to keep his palace. So husbands, when you're armed, you're going to keep your palace. You're going to be able to protect your family, not only physically. Jason, what you, what'd you say you carried? Uh, 19. Glock 19. And what's your wife have? Yeah. And who's the better shot? Absolutely. She'll shoot you dead before you get off the first, squeeze off the first round. Amen. Don't make her mad. Amen. Don't make her mad. Amen. Okay. But he's, I mean, he's just like, he's just like Lisa and I. We got, we got death threats. I see that I can't even connect to it to now. Something's, the devil's messed all this up. We got death threats, and my wife took them seriously and said, uh, we're going to go get our concealed carry license. And so her daddy took her out in the backyard with his twenty two pistol. And buddy, she was hitting bullseye every time. And I went, oh no. Note to self, forget everything you were going to say to her that one day. Just drop it. Don't, don't bring it up. Okay. I believe, I believe you should be armed physically to protect your palace. This church is our palace. We have a, a responsibility in today's age so that no fool comes in here with a death wish wanting to take down God's people. It is our responsibility to protect those in this church who cannot protect themselves against bullets. Okay, I will not apologize for that. I don't care if you don't like that or not. I don't apologize for it. Okay, I will not feel sorry having protected my family or my church from somebody who meant to... Listen, I know I'm supposed to love everybody, but I love these people more than I love anybody. And the guy that comes in here wanting to do harm, he has now become my mortal enemy. And there's nothing... Nothing in the Bible that says I have to give over my, my area of protection to a devil infested man. Not, not one verse of scripture. Don't give me that stuff about turn the other cheek. It's not my cheek I'm protecting. Amen. But then the spiritual aspect of that is that husbands and pastors and any place where there's authority, you have the responsibility of protecting your house, your palace. God gave it to us. God made us men. Put us, get, give us the stronger frame, the stronger frame of mind. God gave that to us as a gift to us because we are the ones to protect the realm. Spiritually, arm yourselves. Don't be a coward. Arm yourself likewise. Arm yourself with the armor, with the armor of God. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him. Think about things that you could have been overcome with. He taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. And I, so I do not any longer believe that the strong man is a mean, ferocious devil that must be bound. I think the strong man is your conscience and your, your decision-making process. And the devils know that they must disarm you so they can then bind you. Once they have you bound, you do what they tell you to do. This is why I do not believe that a born-again, Bible-believing, Holy Ghost-filled saint of the Most High God could ever be possessed 
by a devil. He can be oppressed, depressed, pressed down, pushed around, but not taken over. Okay, that's what I believe. All right, now, so then uh, we go to Ephesians 5, or Ephesians 6. It says, put on the whole armor of God. I'm going to try this one more time because I've got things I've got to show you in picture form. So put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So there's your armor right there that he's talking about. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. The number four will always indicate to you the spiritual realm. I was thinking about this. I'm, I'm preparing a lesson in Sunday school for next Sunday about the three heavens. And if you think about it, starting with this earth, moving up three heavens, that makes where God lives the fourth place. Does that make sense? Earth is the first, first heaven is the second area, the second heaven is the third area, and the fourth area is the third heaven. That's where God rules and that's where God reigns. And that number four always indicates the spiritual realm. So that's why you have four here, principalities. But that's why you have four kingdoms in Daniel chapter 2. The fourth kingdom is always different than the other three. That's because it refers to the spiritual realm. So, put on the whole armor of God, you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, and verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. Did that not come on again? Jared, go push that button, that power button. If you don't do it right, woe be to you. Wherefore... Wherefore, take unto you the, the beatings will continue until everybody smiles. All right. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Uh, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having the breast on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So, uh, we dealt with, on, on this first part, we dealt with this issue of principalities. Principalities deal with every place where there is someone in authority. Principalities love to get Whoever's in charge out of the way so that they can move in and take over. Think of the story of Naboth's vineyard. Naboth was in authority over that vineyard. He had rights to it. He had authority over it. The vineyard is your family. The vineyard is the church. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. The vineyard is the kingdom and so on. And so Jezebel is the agent of change. It is her job to see to it that what belongs to you is taken from you and given over to Ahab who represents the devil. That's what her... What's do it's messing me up. It's really irritating me to no end. So I'm, I'm done fooling with it. You guys just going to have not see the pictures that I had. How's that? Okay. Hebrews 13, 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls. Where authority is, is protection. So where God places authority, he's, he's using that to protect whatever it is that's under there. And he tells those who are under authority, stay under that authority. That's where your protection is. When you find yourself out from underneath authority, you are out of protection. God can bless you and protect you if you stay in the sheepfold. You get, you willingly get out of that sheepfold, you're in danger and you put yourself there. And, uh, Jason and I talk about, we basically have the, the same enemies on the internet. I mentioned a guy and he said, yep, I know that guy. And I mentioned a gal and he said, yep, I have problems out of her too. 
So for some reason, the same people that hate him hate me. And if I had a choice, I would just assume they just hate him and leave me alone. I think he could handle it better. Okay. But these people have removed themselves out from underneath biblical authority. And the reason why they act the way they do is because there are devils in them or working through them or using them somehow, some way. They don't recognize it, but that... Did the prophets of Ahab know that it was an evil spirit, a lying spirit that was in their mouth? They had no idea. They just said whatever came to them, but they, they had a spirit in them telling Ahab their lies. And Ahab believed it. But they, they had no idea that that's what was going on. So that's the area of principalities. Now let's deal with the area of powers. And what I have on this, turn to Deuteronomy 18. Powers, I believe, are the working of devils through human agents, causing them to have supernatural or above natural, beyond natural powers. Like the, the man from the Gadarenes who was able to break iron fat. That is a supernatural power. It is not normal. For, as far as I'm concerned, these new age people that walk on coals of fire and their foot is not burned, that is not natural. And those, they have a devil that is protecting them from being burned. And you know what? These people work through Fortune 500 companies. They're top managers. They want, to, they want to make them think that it's the power of positive mental confessions. If you just believe you won't get burnt, you won't get burnt. I would get burnt. Okay? But... What they're doing is that they're teaching them meditation practices that open their mind up to satanic suggestions. And then these people, I mean, what does the Bible say? Can a man walk on coals in his feet not be burned? I mean, the Bible says that. And the answer is, uh, no, they're going to get their feet burned. So what is it that these people do? They walk on hot coals and all of a sudden their feet are not burned. Okay? People who somehow, some way have the ability to pierce themselves with spikes and different things. And when they pull them out, there's not even a wound there. Okay? I believe that. I believe that people sell themselves out to satanic powers so that they can do things they could not ordinarily do. Amen? Uh, let me tell you about rock and roll stars. Your average rock and roll god, the rock and roll artist who reaches the pinnacle of success, has all the, has all the money, has all the drugs, all the whiskey and wine that he wants, all the women that he wants, or men... He has everything that he wants. That man has sold his soul out to a satanic force. And that force has guaranteed this man that he will be able to perform on stage in a way that's not possible. Some of these singers are singing notes that to me are not natural. They're not possible. It's not possible for a man to sing that way. Um, many of them have testified, they have openly stated that when they get out on stage, something takes over them. From the moment the curtain rises, they are no longer in control of their fingers, their playing, the music, nothing. Okay? Um, the Grateful Dead. Who was the guy, that, the lead of the Grateful Dead? Jerry Garcia. Was known to be able to go out on stage and they would start in on a song... And then they were known for, in the middle of that song, Jerry Garcia would start breaking into guitar riffs that sometimes went on 20, 30, 40 minutes, the same song. And playing riffs that you would just look at the man's fingers and go, how in the world is he able to do that? Okay? These people have powers that 
they did not get in a natural way. So Deuteronomy 18, these are the things that God said, do not do. Verse Deuteronomy 18, verse 9, when thou come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or go through an abortion mill. Because I think that kind of fits in there. You are, I'm going to tell you what they are doing. They're sacrificing their child for their own personal welfare. That's why they would offer their children up to uh, Chemosh or I can't remember what his other name was. Milcom, they would offer their children up to these gods to be burnt so that in return the gods would favor them with good crops that year. And when a person goes to an abortion mill to, to murder their child, it is so that their personal lifestyle is not restricted or hindered by having an unwanted child. That's the sickening nature of our nation nowadays. So, and he said, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. Underline that. Witchcraft is big now. Or a charmer, consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, those who get in contact with the dead, or those who receive power from the dead. For all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. So what God's saying is, I drove them out for doing this and I put you in their land. If I catch you doing what they did, I'm going to drive you out. And that's exactly what God did. Even now, the Jews are in the land, but from one day to the next, they have no guarantee that that land's still going to be theirs. They are under constant threat of being totally annihilated. Okay? So it won't be until they realize Jesus is the Messiah that God will make it permanent with them. But anyway, he said he'd drive them out. Verse 13, thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God for these nations which thou shalt possess. Hearken unto observance of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, listen to this now. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. So, pretend you're looking up on the screen at this picture I got. Yeah, that's good, isn't it? Charismatics now using Christian tarot cards. That's cardomancy using cards as a form of divination. Divination is trying to know what is in the future or trying to discern secrets or secret teachings or secret formulas or whatever it is from spirits using various means like cards or palmistry or reading goat entrails or tea leaves or whatever it is. Anything except reading the Bible and asking God, God, show me the truth. Anything but that. So it's called destiny reading cards. And those who are associated with the other Bethel Church in Redding, California, the anti-Bethel Church in Redding, California, are engaging in what is essentially tarot card reading. Uh, they call it reading and refer to the program as Christ or Christ alignment. In other words, they have these cards that they will lay out and that supposedly is showing, that is Christ showing you what's going to happen in your life. That's, that's just satanic Cardomancy is divination. They don't do predictions, but they will help empower your destiny rather than control it. Using what is essentially tarot cards, they do a reading about relations, jobs, and issues to help people make better decisions in the future. That's cardomancy. The tarot is a pack of playing cards made originally in the 1400s, Italy and France, which are meant to help psychics divine the truth either about the future or a present situation. Some assume the name is taken from the Tarot River in Italy. Explicitly, occultic tarot cards include a 78-card pack 
uh, as opposed to all the other kinds of tarot which are implicitly occulting, the charismatics at Bethel Church and elsewhere have commandeered this satanic practice and seek to help people gain insight into their life from these readings. Now what this, this one particular lady that is on staff at the Bethel Church in Redding, California, she will go to these hippie festivals like Burning Man, or around the country. They had one down south here about a year or so ago. They will have these Woodstock wannabe festivals where every weird thing in the country shows up. Men and women, half-dressed, undressed, dressed in various costumes, and they're just surrounded with all these little tents and, and kiosks where they can go and, and learn something about, you know, crystals over here. They can learn where to get the best marijuana over here. They can learn about where to, you know, have tarot card readings over here. And then they come to the, the anti-Bethel church kiosk where there's a woman there who's on staff at Bethel church who gives them a Christ alignment reading for them and says, we're using this to introduce Jesus to them. It's the wrong Jesus. If you're teaching them magic and divination and then saying, here's Jesus, that's not the same Jesus. Yeah, amen. Now, there's a lady by the name of Valerie Love. What a name, Valerie Love. Uh, this is from the Christian Post. It says, stop thinking you can tell people how to worship. Stop thinking you can tell people how to connect with the divine. Notice they're not saying, be saved. Connect with the divine. Uh, the article says, I can tell you how many people have told me you can't be a Christian witch, but here I am. See, you can't tell me how to worship. You cannot tell me how to connect with the divine. That's between me and God. You cannot tell me how to pray. A defiant... Valerie Love declared in a recent rant on Facebook. She explained that she was born a witch. You know what? I believe that. Just talk to her parents and some of her ex-boyfriends. They'll tell you. She was born a witch, but was forced to stifle her identity as a Jehovah's Witness from age four to... Th frying pan fire. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. And when she was 30 years old, she finally left the cult of Jehovah's Witness. Now, where do we get off? Here's what she said. Where do we get off believing that we can actually dictate to other people how they worship? It's not, uh, it's not our lane, Love said. I was born a witch and love it. I'm so thankful people are afraid of the word witch because of fear and ignorance. She says that this book is ignorance. When God said, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And she said, I am here as a minister of the living God to dispel fear and ignorance. So she has a website. Do not pull up your phone and go to this website on our internet. Okay? It is a website for Christian witches. Now, my tongue had problems saying those two words together. I wasn't sure if I could get it out. Huh? Yeah, oxymoron. Like Fonzie trying to say he was wrong. I was... I don't know if you remember that those days. Christian... I can't say it. Listen. We, we should have known at some point this was going to pop up. Because what happens is the witchcraft and the spirits have already by subversion moved in in various ways into churches all across the country, all across the world. Various practices, various rituals that are done in churches, various, what are they called, gener removing generational curses. Listen, if, you've, if you think you have generational curse, go to the cross. Because all the curses are lifted by the cross. Amen. Don't, but see, there are people who...
who go around, who make big noise about this because they want people to be following them. They want them, they want them to think that they've got some big gift from God that they would, they would never have, they would never be released from this if they hadn't come to them. Usually they don't mind charging for these little rituals. But these people will tell these, will fill their minds full of, well, I know you're saved. I believe you're a Christian, but you, you your grandfather, uh, was an occultist. Your grandmother, she practiced witchcraft. That's been passed down to you. And th- that's the reason why, this is the reason why you're in rebellion to your husband is because your grandma was a witch. And I actually knew a family. It was a husband and wife and they were having marital problems. And they were trying to, they, they would call me to get counseling, but then they were going to this other pastor who was telling them that the re, the whole source of the matter was the woman. She was constantly yelling, screaming, cursing at her husband. And she had this pastor telling her that it really wasn't her fault, that she had a generational curse on her. And so if they could just find out what devil this was and name this devil, and make him go away, and have this ritual done to relieve this curse, then she would stop doing that. And I said, that sounds to me like an excuse for bad behavior. Your problem is not that you're full of a devil. Your problem is you are in rebellion to the word of God, and you're wanting to pass the buck off like it's not your fault. Meanwhile, her husband, he had his own set of problems that was related to the fact that he couldn't be romantic with his wife whenever he snapped his finger. And I said, that's another problem that's in this little situation. If you want to try to blame that on devils, you go ahead. But the problem lies in your heart. It's not some devil's fault. Now, I believe devils are part of it. But you're the, you're the one that's responsible for getting rid of this thing. You don't need a ritual. You need the cross. Amen? Amen. So this website is devoted to Christian witchcraft. And it's now coming out in the surface because we're now living in a time where it's becoming more and more acceptable to be something other than a traditional Bible-believing Christian. In other words, we have gotten so far away from the traditions of our fathers, from the Bible. We've gotten so far away from that, that now witches are rising up within the ranks of churches and denominations. You've got, you've got churches and denominations that are, uh, they're playing lovey-dovey with Rome, with the Vatican, and they're compromising every which way in the world and they're basically setting up situations where devils feel very comfortable dwelling in those houses. The reason being is there's no light there. And devils just love a place where there's darkness. And they find it. They find it in homes. They find it in churches. They find it in denominational headquarters. They find it everywhere. So to me, it's... So here we have in the space of about a month, you got on one side, you've got a church promoting Christian witchcraft, then another church promoting ethical pornography. Yeah. Which is, so now it's no wonder that these same churches will align themselves with, number one, the marijuana crowd. Number two, the sodomite marriage crowd. So now they'll perform sodomite marriages. They'll have sodomites in their churches. They'll have them as leaders in their churches and think nothing of it. And we're the oddball fundamentalists who are not going to go along with the program. That's powers. And the effect that they are having now in a world that is absent the word of God. Because that's really all it takes. Remove, remember how, how, the, how the devil would take control in a person's life. Bind a strong man and remove his armor. Once you got him to lay down his armor, you could then go in and bind 
the strong man and possess that man's house and he is possessed now of a devil. But it takes them convincing people to lay down their weapons, their shields, their swords, their helmets, and everything else that goes with it. And the devil, for the most part, has succeeded in that in a large portion of churches. Without knowing this 100%, I mentioned this morning that Jason is a, uh, he has a reputation up where he lives for being a street preacher. And on top of the sodomites and the witches and everybody else, the Lord of the Rings crowd that hates his guts for what he's saying up there, I almost bet you there are church members who hate his guts as well. Am I right? You laugh, so I want to hear the story. Because obviously a story went through your head. I want to hear it. Can we say it in, on camera or should we just leave it alone? I see that nervous laugh. I'll leave it alone. But obviously, churches are against him preaching the gospel. Yeah. That are more satanic than they are yeah. than they are Christian. And these pastors, these people, like they have the, these churches will they will protest what we're doing and say we're not with those guys. That's what they do. We're oh we're not with we don't believe in most of the offense in street preaching today, when you're out on the street, are professing Christian people. They are the most How did I know that? Spit in our face. I've been spit on. Uh, you know, some of our guys have been punched. And the, most of these people are professing religious yeah. people. Yeah. Yep. I guarantee you, you never had to ask them what Bible they read. Yeah, they hate that. The King James. Yeah. They absolutely. That's, that's that. See, in the absence of of the light of the word of God. These devils are just, they're drawn to the darkness in a person's life, whether it be witchcraft, sorcery, necromancy, or false Christianity. Because false Christianity is just as dark as witchcraft is. Because it is absent the light of the word of God. Oh, they have Bibles. But they're corrupted versions. And they have no light whatsoever in them. Okay? So the same spirit that would abide in those who practice these powers. Same spirit is in these churches. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 9. And let me just kind of add this to it tonight. And we'll... We'll kind of wind it down here in a minute. But as long as there are any kinds of these spirits working, let's say in your family, working on one of your family members, or working behind the scenes in a church, working through one of your church people, as long as the mistress of witchcraft is present there, there will be no peace in that church. 
There'll be no peace in that home. Where devils are, there's never the prince of peace. When Christ is allowed to have his way in our hearts, there's absolute perfect peace. When Christ is reigning supreme in a family, that family is going to be at peace. When Christ is reigning supreme in a church and his spirit is in that church, there'll be peace in that church. Because he is the prince of peace. In his absence, there's no peace. There's always chaos. There's always distress. There's always fightings and backstabbings and everything else in the world going on. But there's no peace. 2 Kings 9, 22, And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu, that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. Whenever powers are present with their witchcraft, with their necromancy, with their divination, with their darkness and their hatred for God's word, when they are present, you know it. There's nothing but fighting. Nothing but chaos. Things are not right. Things are not, things just don't make sense. You may not be able to understand what's going on. But you know that there is no peace. God used this verse with me one time to reveal to me a person who was going to church here, who was using me and a false conversion to gain access to our daycare and become the leader of it. And I had no idea what was going on. And I prayed and I fasted. And I said, God, show me in the Bible. And I opened up 2 Kings 9, and I looked at it, and I thought, well, it's not going to be there. And I went to turn, and God said, Mike, look at it. And when I read that verse, what peace so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. And I recognized that there was no peace in this place, and it was because there still was someone here behind the scenes working to subvert. Okay? And I, won't even, I don't have time tonight to tell you how it got revealed. But it was the easiest thing in the world to get revealed. Okay? Because she ended up running out of this building. I'm not kidding you. Running out of the building. Okay? Never saw her again. Uh, let's go one more place. Let's go to Nahum chapter 3 and then we'll close on this. Nahum chapter 3. Verse 4. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot. So anytime you're dealing with whoredoms and harlotry, you're dealing with mystery Babylon. She is the ultimate spirit here. The mistress of witchcrafts. Witchcraft by its nature is a feminine religion. It is a, it is a feminine based religion. It is a religion of intuition. A religion of female rebellion to authority. What's interesting to me is the number for Babylon is the number 13. And in Wicca, in American Wicca, they have 13 principles exactly that they follow. And the sixth principle that Wiccans follow in this country is, we do not regard any earthly hierarchy of authority. Which means... Rebellion. Rebellion is as the sin of... It's right there in their doctrinal statement. That their witchcraft is nothing but pure rebellion. A witch, a true witch, will not ever submit to anybody's authority. That's why when they are in your church, they despise you secretly and they despise the Word of God. Because it's authority. And they hate it. Think about, think about Jezebel. What did she do for Ahab? She disregarded Naboth's God-given authority over his vineyard. And she said, I'll get it for you. I'll get it for you. And she rose up two false witnesses and had Naboth hung and killed and said, There you go, Ahab. Here's your vineyard now. Okay? And, and Jehu was right. As long as Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many, there's not going to be peace. 
As long as she's allowed to live and thrive, you'll never, ever have peace. These are the powers that we have got to be shielded against. The armor that God has given you will work if you'll at least put it on. But it does no good tucked away in a drawer somewhere. And what I mean by that is read the Bible, believe the Bible, let God work the Bible in you, meditate on these things, and I guarantee you, you'll win. Now, you may end up licking a lot of wounds afterwards, but you'll win. Okay? I've dealt with her many times, and I'm telling you, I'm like Elijah. After he got done dealing with Jezebel, he, run, he ran and hide, hid. And he said, I just, I just soon go on and die now, God, because it, it bothered him bad having to deal with her. Okay? That's, she is so dangerous. But anyway, the mistress of witchcraft that selleth nations through her whoredoms, and families, watch this, families through her witchcraft. Watch over your family. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will shew the nations thy nakedness, and the kingdoms thy shame. Now, I want to say this. If you're a Jezebel, if you are a Jezebel, I say, I don't think there's one here. I don't know everybody that's watching online. But if you're a Jezebel, God will expose you and uncover you before everybody. And he'll not be nice about it. Am I right? This Bible's right. What, when you work against the Spirit of God, God will strip you down naked in front of everybody. He'll show everybody who you are. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile and I will set thee as a gazing stock and it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say Nineveh is laid waste and who shall bemoan her? When shall I seek comforters for thee? Comfort is the Holy Ghost. There'll be no comfort for you. There'll be no Holy Ghost for you. You'll read the Bible and not get anything out of it. No comfort, nothing. Because of your rebellion is this witchcraft. Because of your witchcraft, because of your whoredoms, because you're working behind the scenes. You think you're doing the will of God, working behind the scenes. And you know what? I actually have people in mind I'm preaching this to. Thank God they're not here. Okay? But we'll deal with them from time to time. Okay? Because anytime you stand for the Bible and stand for the blood... And stand for the truth and stand for biblical authority, she'll always show up and try to destroy that. It's her nature. She can't help it. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. That's enough witchcraft for tonight. I can't take no more. Amen. Now, let me say this to everybody else. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. I have a little bit of a rebellious nature in me. Okay? It's there. I don't like it. I try to subdue it as much as possible. Get in the Word. Study this Bible. Make it part of your... How long have I been your pastor and how long will I be your pastor until the day I cannot talk anymore? I'm going to tell you, your Bible has to be with you all the time. Especially in the world that we live in. Okay? Snakes don't need but about this much to get in. Okay? So keep yourself close to the Word of God. Okay? And that little rebellion streak you got in you, God will keep it where it needs to be. Father in heaven, thank you, God, for taking us out of a spirit of rebellion, a spirit of whoredoms, a spirit of witchcraft. God, I hate it. I hate the workings of Jezebel and her whoredoms and her witchcrafts, God. I hate it. I hate what she does to families. I hate what she does to churches and pastors. God, I have... 
pastors, Lord, that I thought would be solid have been destroyed by her whoredoms. And God, it just, it shook me. Because I thought these guys could never be taken down. And it scared me, God. Because who am I? And God, I pray, Lord, that throughout all my days, you would continue to remove us from the whoredoms and the rebellion that we used to be part of. God, we don't want anything to do with it, but Father, we are powerless in and of ourselves to defeat her. It must be done by way of the cross. So Father, Lord, help us to yield ourselves and submit ourselves to your word and to your love and to your authority, God. And take a strong stand because the evil day is approaching. And God, we're going to need everything that you can give us, Lord, to be able to stand in that evil day. God, help us to not forsake our armor. Help us to not lose it. Help us to never lay our armor aside. But Father, keep it close to us. As close, Lord, as a sword is to a soldier. A service revolver is to a police officer. God, help us to keep our swords, our Bibles, that close. Never lay our weapons down. Never lay our shield down, God. But keep it always for your kingdom and your glory's sake. Thank you, God, for this lesson tonight. We pray, Lord, your blessing on it. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed tonight. Thank you for coming.